कैन यू एक्सप्लेन मी लिटिल बिट इन डिटेल हाउ ब्रॉडकास्ट ज्वाइन विल अवॉइड द शफलिंग फर्स्टली ब्रॉडकास्ट ज्वाइन इज मोर फोकस्ड ऑन यू नो ब्रॉडकास्टिंग अ स्मॉलर सेट ऑफ डेटा और डिफरेंट यू नो डिफरेंट नोड्स व्हिच आर अवेलेबल इन अ क्लस्टर सो बेसिकली व्हेन वी आर गोइंग टू गो अहेड एंड परफॉर्म एनी स्पेसिफिक काइंड ऑफ ज्वाइन वी डोंट नीड टू हैव एन एंटायर डेटा टू बी शफल्ड व्हिच विल इवेंचुअली यू नो कॉस्ट अस अ लॉट ऑफ फ्रीक्वेंसी टू बी यूटिलाइज्ड that is eventually going to cost the the organization and it is going to eventually increase the cost of the system so basically what in broadcast join we do is that we broadcast the smaller data set on the different nodes which are available so that whenever we have to go ahead and perform the joins for that specific data set so it will be done within that specific node instead of directly shuffling the data across the different nodes which is the efficient option to infer the schema is efficient or to enforce the schema is efficient which is efficient option uh, basically like you have mentioned when when we are reading a data frame we can do it either way we can either use infer schema mm-hmm. or we can explicitly define a schema and use it but now the difference between these two is that when we say infer schema is true like when we set this as true what happens is that when it is reading that particular data so it has to scan the records mm-hmm. and then infer the data types out of it whereas if you are explicitly mentioning the schema for example there is order id and you say of integer type so in those cases what happens is when we compare the performance when you explicitly mention a schema type the performance is better rather than infer schema is equal to true method So, like how is Spark works? Can you quickly guide me Spark architecture? What happens is first, whenever we write a Spark application, it gets uh, the trial program gets uh, executed, and uh, it will try to first make sure if the based on the schema catalog, the uh, you know transform the, the the code that we have written is syntactically correct or not. Once it is validated, it is go uh, it will be creating an unresolved logical plan. So. uh in this unresolved logical plan it will be actually having all the uh, various uh, plans based on uh, cost and role based and then it will go ahead and create logical plan you with the help of catalyst optimizer and uh, finally a physical plan will be created uh, which will then be uh, you know used and let's say if you are running a spark job your job fails then where do you check your logs my logs generally in databricks i will make sure i have a separate uh, log path where all the logs have been fed so suppose if my job doesn't have uh, any logs or so i would open up the job that has uh, recently failed to look into the steps actually where they have so my approach for writing any notebook or writing any operations on a notebook will be firstly i'll uh, try to split the code based on their functionality so i'm uh, importing a couple of libraries or so doing some configurations they will be basically split across multiple cells in the notebook so that it is easy for us to debug later in case of failures generally i have this logger utilities uh, which basically saves my log files so i would go back to in case if we don't have i'll uh, do a manual do you know about the jobs in apache spark jobs stages and tasks in spark basically like whenever an action is called so a job gets created so this job has stages and tasks yeah. task being the smallest workable unit and uh, stages are basically the uh, number of white transformations plus 1 plus gives one. us the number of stages and the number of actions are generally the number of jobs and task basically uh, like i said it's the smallest working unit mm-hmm. and uh, depending on the number of cores in a particular uh, uh, worker node we'll have the uh, number of distributed tasks so yes. as many partitions are there those many tasks will be launched yes So let's say I have ten partition, mm. okay, and I want to assign the number of CPU cores as well for that Spark job. So how are mm. you going to like? What is the number that you are going to give to this many CPU cores I need? It's basically related to how much fast you want to perform mm. your job, how critical that job is. If mm. that job is very critical, and mm. uh, if I have ten partitions, I would just assign the ten cores for that uh, particular job. That is not self-critical, and can have a little greater time according to the other job. We can assign let's say five cores for that five. ten partition. Then it would take a double amount of time. If Correct. if it at all is non-critical itself, we can just assign two cores, then it will take the five times. 
but only thing i'm trying to say is there is no point of assigning 13 holes to a 10 partition job because mm. whatever you do no matter how how are the jobs configuration the course will always be unutilized because mm. 10 course can only handle those 10 partitions right. it will not happen the 10 partitions also get divided into 13 courses and mm. get computers one course will be able to take one partition suppose you have uh, two white transformation okay and mm-hmm. one action this part mm-hmm. and probably you you are handling 2 gb of data mm-hmm. so how many jobs stayed and tasks will be updated so two white transformation means uh, three stages mm-hmm. and uh, uh, one action means uh, one job and uh, we had 2 uh, gb of data so the default block size is 128 mb so we would have around uh, i think 16 partitions or 16 tasks yeah, yes you know the difference between repartition and coalesce repartition is where you know either increasing or decreasing the partitions where coalesce is purely meant for you know decreasing the partitions actually so the primary difference would be like there will be complete shuffle in terms of repartition where the data movement would be huge and where in coalesce there will not be any data movement it just tries to accommodate all the key columns and then it just reduces the partitions Got so it. most of the mm-hmm. cases we had to deal with repartition but it comes at its cost but it will be like one or two times operation once it is set as the, the next thing if the data comes in the pipeline you know it will automatically go to those partitions you know what's the difference between rdd data frame the primary difference is rdd being the basic data structure or the fundamental data structure of this part so even though i write as an uh, data frame behind the scene it is what rdd is being processed actually well rdd as we know uh, it is the basic fundamental so i would use rdds when i'm doing some low level transformations like very minute a set of uh, transformations are happening to my objects or as a data frame they are like a uh, well built with the ability to understand the schema based on the data i feed and uh, i can uh, handle my transformations well with the data frame because of uh, the technicalities such as uh, the optimizers or uh, multiple get lists that are uh, associated with uh, data frames so data frames can be helpful for uh, transforming bigger data whereas rdd might be not that performant oriented when i'm uh, dealing with a larger data what are data frame write modes that you are aware of basically we we use uh, two modes exclusively in our uh, project so they are like you know overwrite and append the difference between these two is that like uh, when i say overwrite what happens is if you want to overwrite your existing data like whatever is there in those kind of scenarios we can do an overwrite or if you are writing it for the first time to a particular mm-hmm. target location in those cases we'll be using overwrite on the other hand append is for like uh, uh, for example there is already some data in the target location and you don't want to disturb that data you just want to append your data to that particular target so in those cases we'll be using uh, append uh, mode like okay. these are the two modes i know any specific techniques you have used while optimizing a pipeline job yes to optimize a pie spark job first of all we need to make sure that the data is cached by caching i mean we have to write multiple data frames so we need to make sure that the full table scan is not done we first have to filter the data and then perform the aggregations so that the data is first filtered as much as possible and then the aggregations are performed now in in, in situations of joins right we can go ahead and do the broadcast join and we can go ahead and do the uh, you know shuffle hash join instead of shuffle merge join so by broadcast join i mean when we have large tables and we have certain small tables dim- no dimension tables then they can be actually copied to each of these executors in- instead of part listening so this really helps in optimization can you explain me how data skewness is handled within pyspark in distributed computing so data skewness is nothing but when your data is not evenly distributed across partition like how pyspark handles it right? so there are different methods through which pyspark handles so one method is using the broadcast channel right? so when you have a two data sets where you have a one data set is smaller and second data set is bigger so you can make use of broadcast join to do that plus you have the option of reducing or increasing the number of partitions using repartition and coalesce in coalesce you will reduce 
reduce the partition in case you want to minimize the shuffle operation. So that is the second option. Plus you can also make use of your dynamic allocation. So in your static, when you're not sure of what will be the workload, what will be the amount of data it gets processed when you're not sure about that. So you can make use of a dynamic allocation. Plus you have basically the partition to have the hash partitions, basically which uniformly distribute the keys. So these are the different types through which Spicebug or Spark handles data skewness. What are the different join strategies available in Spicebug? So there are like uh, two major uh, join strategies. So one is the broadcast join. So if you are going to join two data sets and like comparatively one data set is very uh, significantly small in its size. Let's say we can accommodate it in, within one specific uh, node or like the executor memories like the in memory storage. So if it is like kind of proportionate to that, then we can go ahead and use this broadcast join so that the shuffling can be rectified and locally the joins can be made like the nodes. So so the another one case is if both the data sets are huge in size, then we can go for sort merge join. How does yeah. Spicebox Catalyst Optimizer improves the query performance? So Catalyst Optimizer is a core component of your Spark SQL. Basically, whenever you write any SQL or Spark SQL query, it basically works on your Scala's like a uh, very high level of uh, programming. It makes of those functions in Scala. So what it does is it divides into four phases. So first is the analysis part. Second is your uh, logical plan where it creates the logical plan. Third is your physical plan. And fourth is your code generation. So it optimizes your query vary in a bit like uh, suppose in case you have certain joints so it kind of work as a smart brain it optimize your code it optimizes your query so that your query is execute efficient so this is an internal thing and Spark SQL make use of this catalyst optimizer to kind of process your queries and run it faster yeah so suppose you have 10,000 GB of data or 1,000 GB of data. How will we start the configuration? What will be the ideal number? Obviously, this is not a freak number, but you should have some number for the starting point. So what will be the ideal executor numbers? How will you calculate the executor memory? You can just explain the process. Basically, how we calculate the executors will depend upon the partition size, actually. Mm -hmm. So suppose in one of my project, it is 128 MB, actually. For this 128 MB, I just divide the whole data and divided by 128 MB, whatever the partition is. I get the whole data how much can be it is. Then based on the course, actually, I have read this when you are creating executors, there are two kinds of strategies, thin executor and fat executor. When I have read about both of them, then I have found like if your number of CPU cores are more than five, you will see uh, some HDFS throughput sum. So the best possible way I want to start is like executor with five cores, actually. So based on this, I will see the cluster configuration. So I start with executor core five. Based on that, I will figure out how much maybe each executor do that. Mm -hmm. Then based on that, I will find the number of executors on that.